United States of America is the most powerful country in the history of the world. Its military power, diplomatic and cultural influence, and economic reach are unmatched in the history of recorded civilization. Its constitution and system of government have been emulated by dozens of other nations. And to the many immigrants who leave their homes seeking a better life in America, the country represents a chance for freedom and prosperity that they likely wouldn't have the opportunity for where they come from. But there is a dirty little secret at the heart of the American story. The land the nation was founded on was taken by force from the people who already lived there. The wholesale dispossession and near destruction of the hundreds of American Indian tribes that populated U.S. territory prior to the arrival of Europeans is arguably the worst thing the U.S. has ever done as a nation. An indelible stain on their history that has proven difficult to wash off. The story we're about to tell you is just one of the hundreds of tragic tales of the cruelties and injustices inflicted on the Indians by the Americans, but it is definitely one of the worst. In the 1830s, the U.S. federal government, in conjunction with state militias and thousands of eager private citizens, systematically and brutally forced nearly every American Indian living east of the Mississippi River to leave their ancestral homelands and migrate west to new reservations set aside for them in the as yet untamed west. After stripping them of their land, often for inadequate or no compensation, they were forced to march on foot hundreds of miles, often through inhospitable weather conditions and impassable terrain. Thousands of them died of disease, malnutrition, or exposure. In some cases, they arrived in their new home with nothing, having been fleeced or robbed out of everything they owned on the journey. The Potawatomis who were forced on the journey called it the Trail of Death, but it is the name the Cherokees came up with that is stuck in the public imagination. The Trail Where They Cried, or more simply, the Trail of Tears. Meanwhile, the lands they'd been born and raised on were greedily divided up by the white settlers. They congratulated themselves on finally getting rid of the savages that used to live there, opening the way for their own economic prosperity, their own American dream. Some people protested, but no one intervened to stop what was happening. In the end, the racial politics of the day won out. This is not an easy story to tell or to hear about. It is graphic. It is horrifying. And it is sad, but it is a story that needs to be told, and that everyone, particularly Americans like myself, need to hear. Welcome back to Geographics. I'm your host, Eric Malachite, and this is the story of the five tribes, and the Trail of Tears as written by Ben Edelman. In 1828, Andrew Jackson, a Tennessee politician and planter, was elected the seventh president of the United States. Jackson was a war hero, having defeated the Red Stick Creeks in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in 1814, protected New Orleans from a British attack in 1815, and led U.S. forces in the First Seminole War, which resulted in Spain ceding Florida to the United States. He had ridden a wave of popular support that mostly came from the South and West of the country, where his appeal to the common man against the social and political elites had particularly resonated. One of the first items on the new administration's agenda was what to do about the so-called Indian problem. The country had expanded its borders rapidly in the 50 years since the Revolutionary War, and U.S. territory now completely surrounded the borders of many American Indian tribes who had not sold or been forced off their land. Up to this point, the official policy of the U.S. government towards the tribes had been to encourage assimilation, that is, to encourage the Indians to adopt Western ways, including dressing and farming the way the whites did, converting large numbers of them to Christianity, and to eventually integrate them into white society as American citizens. No one better embodied the process of assimilation than the five large tribes in the American Southeast, known as the Five Civilized Tribes the Creeks, Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Seminoles. All of them, to varying degrees, had incorporated many aspects of white civilization into their own culture. They wore European-style clothing, gave themselves and their children white names. They learned to grow wheat and other European crops instead of the traditional three sisters of corn, beans, and squash. 
They sent their sons to white schools to learn English and the complexities of the American legal system, and the Cherokees successfully transcribed their native language into written form and book translations, contracts, letters, and their own newspaper, the Cherokee Eagle, soon followed. Some of the wealthiest members of the tribe participated in southern plantation culture, which included owning black slaves. However, by the time Andrew Jackson became president, the white residents of the South were growing impatient with a slow pace of assimilation. The main source of contention between whites and Indians was over a fundamental difference between the two cultures in how they treated land. In Europe, where most of their ancestors had come from, land was a scarce commodity. It was a source of power and wealth to the elite of society. In order to make their dreams of economic prosperity, which was what led them across the ocean in the first place, come true, they needed to own land, and lots of it. To the Indians, land was not a commodity. It was the sacred land of their ancestors, the place that the Great Spirit had specifically set aside for them to live on forever. Individual members of the tribe did not own the land. It was the collective inheritance of the entire community. The white neighbors of the southeastern tribes neither knew nor cared about the nuances behind the Indian mindset towards their homeland. What they saw was a lot of land being occupied by a relatively small number of Indians. Besides, according to the racial politics of the day, whites were the superior race. Even the wealthiest, most educated Cherokee or Choctaw was inferior to the most ignorant white man. If the Indians would not give up their land voluntarily, they needed to be forced to, and that was where Andrew Jackson came in. Jackson was committed from the start of his presidency to embark on a new federal program called Indian Removal. Yeah, seriously. The idea was that the federal government would trade the tribe's existing lands for new ones west of the Mississippi River, in unorganized federal territory that would become known as Indian Country. Today, it is the U.S. state of Oklahoma. In Jackson's mind, forcing the Indians to move was the most humane solution to the problem. Otherwise, the white settlers would simply move in and wipe the Indians out, as had happened pretty much everywhere else in the country in the previous 200 years. The Indian Removal Act was not universally popular. Most of the opposition to it came from the North, though there were some Southern politicians that spoke out against it, such as Davy Crockett and Sam Houston, both from Jackson's home state of Tennessee. Nevertheless, the act passed both houses of Congress and was signed into law by the president in 1830. Forcing the tribes off their land was now official government policy. State governments followed suit, particularly Georgia, who claimed most of the Cherokee Nation as being within its borders. Georgia had been trying for years to get their hands on Cherokee land, particularly once gold was discovered there in 1828. They passed a series of draconian laws which stripped the Cherokees of most of their rights as Georgia citizens, including prohibiting them from owning land and forbidding them from giving court testimony in any case involving a white person. This was a blatant attempt to coerce them into leaving the state. Most of the Indians were not interested in emigrating to new lands. They wanted to stay where they were. Resistance to removal took a number of forms. Tribes reorganized their governments, formed new constitutions declaring themselves sovereign states, and sent representatives to Washington to try and negotiate on their people's behalf. The Cherokees, led by their chief, John Ross, believed that their best chance to remain on their land was through the federal court system. Hiring a former U.S. Attorney General to represent them, they took their case to the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court, which actually ruled in their favor in 1832 in Worcester versus Georgia. In the decision, Chief Justice John Marshall wrote that state governments have no right to interfere with Indian affairs or Indian territory. That power resided solely with the federal government. However, the Jackson administration and the Georgia government simply ignored the decision. Supposedly, President Jackson said, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him go and enforce it. That particular quote, may have been apocryphal, but it certainly reflected what Jackson's sentiment was. The Seminoles of Florida preferred a more direct approach. They went to war to defend their land. The Second Seminole War, which raged from 1835 to 1842, has been called the longest and costliest Indian war in U.S. history. 
The Seminoles were initially led by their talented war chief, Osceola, who specialized in hit-and-run tactics on military outposts and white settlements before melting back into the Florida swamps. The war dragged on for years, as the army cycled through several generals who tried to suppress the Seminoles and convince them to move west, mostly without success. In the end, it was war weariness and food shortages that brought the Seminoles in, but not before both sides sustained a combined 5,000 casualties. Federal negotiators were dispatched to the tribes to attempt to negotiate peaceful treaties that would result in their removal west. The Choctaws were the first to agree to leave in 1831. The Chickasaws sold their land to the United States for $3 million, although it took the government three decades to actually pay them for it. Most of the Creeks left in 1834. The Cherokees, however, held out. Even while whites encroached on their territory, and the state of Georgia conducted a land lottery to decide who had the right to purchase it. The government was not about trickery to accomplish their goals. They took advantage of dissenting opinions among the tribes to accomplish these goals, and nowhere was this seen more clearly than in the Treaty of New Echota, in which the Cherokees agreed to give up their lands and move west. This treaty was not agreed to by the Cherokee leadership, but by a minority faction of about 20 Cherokee who believed that moving west was the only way for their people to survive. They were actually violating Cherokee law. Any individual member of the tribe who agreed to sell or cede Cherokee territory without the consent of the entire tribe was a capital offense. Despite the fact that the treaty did not represent the will of most of the Cherokee, the U.S. government used it as the authority they needed to remove every member of the tribe. They gave the Cherokees two years after the ratification of the treaty in 1836 to move on their own. However, by the time the deadline passed, only some 2,000 Cherokee had left. The remaining 16,000 refused to leave. In May 1838, the U.S. Army moved in, 7,000 soldiers commanded by General Winfield Scott. They went from house to house, rounding up Cherokee men, women, and children at gunpoint and herding them into stockades, like prisoners. Most of them were not permitted to bring any of their belongings and left only with the clothes on their backs. Their homes and possessions were left behind to be looted by the whites that came to claim their land once they were gone. The Cherokee were kept in the camps until it was time to move them, and they were forced to march hundreds of miles over land to their new homes in Indian country. This would not have been an easy trek for anyone to make, much less a group of thousands which included the elderly and young children. There were few, if any, roads and no shelter from the elements since they were not permitted to enter any towns on their route. There was little to protect them from the extreme weather, scorching heat and drought in the summer, and brutal cold and snow in the winter. The biggest killer was disease, cholera, dysentery, pneumonia, yellow fever, and more, which were exacerbated by the brutal weather conditions and by malnutrition. Everywhere they went, white people surrounded them like locusts, trying to cash in on the situation by dramatically overcharging for supplies at river crossings, and selling the Cherokees copious amounts of moonshine and whiskey, as many found getting drunk the only way to numb themselves to the sorrow and horror all around them. By the time the last group had reached Indian country in March 1839, an estimated 4,000 Cherokees, 25% of the entire tribe, had died. The experience of the Cherokees on the Trail of Tears was not a unique one. In fact, it was a repetition of what had happened to every other tribe that had been moved west in preceding years. At least 2,000 Choctaws died on their journey. They were the first to coin the term Trail of Tears to describe the experience, which would not enter popular use until later. At least 3,500 Creeks died, as did hundreds of Chickasaws and Seminoles. Nor were these tribes the only ones to be removed west in the wake of the Indian Removal Act. The government also forced tribes elsewhere in the country to leave. The Shawnees, Delaware, Senecas, Potawatomis, Ottawas, Sauk, Fox, and Kickapoos were all forced to leave their homes as well. In all, some 60,000 people representing eight different tribes were forcibly relocated between 1830 and 1850. 
By the time it was over, there were hardly any American Indians left east of the Mississippi River. A few isolated bands located on land nobody else wanted anyway, as well as a few hundred light-skinned mixed bloods who were taken in by white friends or relatives. Despite the protests of some influential Americans, such as Ralph Waldo Emerson, the Indian removals were overwhelmingly popular with a majority of Americans at the time, particularly in the South which eagerly swept into the vacated Indian lands and took them for themselves. Andrew Jackson was easily re-elected in 1832, and his hand-picked successor, Martin Van Buren, followed him into the White House in 1836. Most people simply chose to forget what had happened. There were more important things to worry about, like the growing rift between the North and the South over the issue of slavery. Meanwhile, the displaced tribes in Indian country were left to start their civilization over from scratch, one of the most immediate problems they faced was conflict with Plains Indians tribes who were native to the region, like the Osages, who viewed them as invaders. The Cherokees, who were mournful and angry over what had happened to them, enacted brutal vengeance against the members of the Treaty Party, who they decried as traitors. The most prominent signers of the Treaty of New Echota were murdered by fellow Cherokees soon after the Trail of Tears. The most ludicrous notion of the entire Indian removal affair was the idea that once the tribes had been relocated to Indian country, that they would be left alone by the whites, that they could keep this land forever. Over the course of the next 60 years, as Americans pushed further and further west, took more and more land from plains and western tribes, the five civilized tribes attempted to bounce back, to rebuild their societies. But looking back on it now, it seemed inevitable that once the Americans had conquered the rest of the country and forced every other tribe into submission, they would come back for them. In 1898, six decades after the Trail of Tears, Congress passed the Curtis Act. This made the tribes in Oklahoma subject to the earlier Dawes Act, which abolished tribal governments and broke up the Indian reservations, awarding each family a plot of 160 acres that they had title to own or sell. The remaining surplus land was sold off by the government, mostly to non-Indians. This act, which was supposedly to force all Indians to give up their heritage and to assimilate into white society, also proved to be another elaborate theft of Indian land. 90 million acres of it nationwide in 40 years the act was in force. This jurisdictional change allowed Oklahoma to be admitted as a U.S. state in 1907. In spite of these setbacks, the relocated tribes have done remarkably well for themselves. Tribal governments were gradually re-established throughout the 20th century as the U.S. switched from a policy of assimilation to one of self-government. In 2020, the landmark Supreme Court decision of McGirt v. Oklahoma ruled that the reservations set aside for the five tribes were never officially disestablished by Congress meaning that full jurisdictional authority over them reverted from the state of Oklahoma to the tribes and the federal government. The decision, the ramifications of which have yet to be fully explored, means that 43% of the land area of the state of Oklahoma is officially considered tribal land, including the entirety of the city of Tulsa, the second largest in the state. Today, the five tribes have a combined population of 820,000. Their economies have done better than many other tribal reservations have. All five tribes own and operate multiple casinos, as well as myriad other businesses that provide revenue for the tribal development and social services. They have sponsored numerous cultural initiatives in recent years in an effort to keep their historical heritage alive. The Cherokee Nation, for instance, has spent $3 million on an effort to teach young children the Cherokee language. The hope being that 50 years from now, 80% of tribal members will be fluent in it. For a long time, caught up in notions of manifest destiny and racial superiority, most Americans paid little attention to the Trail of Tears, or any of the other hundreds of atrocities committed against American Indians over the course of 250 years. It has only been in the last 50 years that serious scholarly attention has been paid to it, and what has emerged is a somber reanalysis of the events that transpired, particularly the Trail of Tears. Many historians today argue that what the government did to the Indian tribes of the Southeast constitutes genocide. Others use the term ethnic cleansing, 
it is hard to argue with either description. But what the entire affair boiled down to, the central crime that was committed, was theft. Millions of acres of land were stolen, land that today is worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And the resources on them represent further sources of wealth that were systematically stripped from the tribes and handed over to white people. And that isn't even taking into account the physical and mental hardships inflicted on those who survived the trail. The grief felt by those who lost everything, including their entire families, and the almost total loss of an entire people's cultural and spiritual heritage. The hammer of this reanalysis has fallen hardest on the legacy of Andrew Jackson, who was for a long time considered to be one of America's greatest presidents, but is now vilified as the architect of Indian removal. Among other things, this has resulted in plans by the Biden administration to remove Jackson's portrait from future printings of the $20 bill. Although in retrospect, it would probably be more insulting to Jackson to keep him on there. The man had a notorious hatred of paper money. As easy as it is to blame Jackson for what happened, responsibility for the Trail of Tears does not start or end with him. After all, thousands of other federal and state lawmakers, government officials, soldiers, and settlers helped pass the Indian Removal Act in the first place, or helped to carry it out, and millions of citizens approved of the course of action the government took. No. Instead, blame lies with the United States as a whole, because the entire country allowed it to happen. That's why it's so important for Americans and other people to hear the story of the Trail of Tears, not only because these people deserve to be remembered, but also to prevent it from happening again. And if you think it can't happen, just remember that most of the people at the time believed relocating the Indians was for their own good. And look how that turned out. I hope you found this video to be educational. And if you did, share it with anyone that needs to hear this story. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy.